I'm Laura Bush, the Editorial Director of Spectroscopy, and I'm here today with Volker Decker of Friedrich Schiller University of Vienna. Volker, thank you for joining us today. Hello, Laura. Thanks for inviting me for this interview. Thank you. So you're well known for your work on tip-enhanced Raman spectroscopy, or TERS. Could you briefly describe this technique and how it is different from SERS? Yes, sure. Um, well, tip-enhanced Raman spectroscopy makes use of uh, electromagnetic field enhancing capabilities of single metallic nanoparticles. Well, in this respect, it is very similar to surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, or SERS. In contrast to SERS, where you use mostly many particles or agglomerates of, of many particles, here we use only one single particle. And this particle is then positioned by using an atomic force microscope with nanometer precision on a sample surface. Therefore, uh, ideally we have a flat surface, and uh, in that case, always the same part of the nanoparticle is contacting the sample which yields a very reliable enhancement of this single particle. This is a bit in contrast to SERS, where the sample might be right on the particle, beside the particle, or even between two particles, and that's causing them slightly different enhancement features. So that's, in short, uh, the similarities and the dissimilarities of SERS and TERS. Mm -hmm. What are the main challenges involved in using TERS? Well, I think uh, a common challenge for all these near-field optical techniques, and TERS is a part of the near-field optical techniques, are the probes. So you have to reliably and reproducibly make these tips, we call them tips, uh, which have these nanoparticles on the very end of uh, a tapered fiber or a tapered AFM tip. And so far, these tips are produced in the labs that do TERS. And uh, hopefully, we can involve some companies soon, because that's uh, quite tedious. And I think if you can industrialize that, it would be much more reliable. And also, uh, much more labs can profit from that. You have published a number of studies recently using TERS to look at structures such as hemozoan crystals produced by the malaria parasite, cytochrome proteins of mitochondria, and amyloid fibrils. Is there a commonality to the types of structures that are good candidates to study with TERS? Well, our uh, key uh, knowledge is based on a, a combination of this tip-enhanced thermal spectroscopy and, and bio-related specimen, mostly at least. Uh, other groups work on nanotubes, graphene, or stress in silicon. Our uh, main topic is the bio-related molecules. I think, in, in general, it helps if the sample is quite flat and not too rough. On the other hand, roughness is, is kind of a relative term. If, if, one do, if one does experiments on a sub-micron scale, in the end, everything is very flat on a nanometer scale. In a, an advantage for, for our approach is if the samples are transparent. This is not the prerequisite, because also, uh, this is quite easily achieved if the samples are thin enough. So, uh, in principle, like in Raman spectroscopy, uh, samples can be can vary quite a bit in in, in their occurrence. But uh, we would like them to be transparent. And these examples of the things you've chosen to study, did you also choose them because there was something about the TERS technique that would enable you to answer questions that otherwise have not been able to be answered? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, this technology enables us to answer uh, a question that are uh, not accessible by normal micros microscopy techniques. So they are much below the diffraction limit, so we can distinguish features in the range of a nanometer or at least below 10 nanometers. And normal Raman microscopy can do that down to a range of, let's say, 200, 300 nanometers in, in, in very optimistic cases. So um, everything that uh, you want to know on a, on a very small lateral scale can in principle be answered with TERS if it's 
close enough to the surface. It is very, very surface sensitive. So if it's below the surface, uh, we have a problem. And you can also answer questions by using TERS that you could not answer using surface enhanced Raman? Surface enhanced Raman is, is kind of a different uh, technology. I mean, if you want to obtain information on a lateral scale, a surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy is probably not the method of choice. So for surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, you have to homogenize the sample. So you don't have the lateral uh, differences anymore. So imagine just a, a geological sample. So in that case, you are not interested in many cases to homogenize the sample. You want to distinguish localities. And this you can only do if you put the enhancing site, in our case, the terse probe, to the different localities. And we can do that with a lateral resolution just uh, uh, approaching 1 and 10 nanometers. So that is a big difference if you compare SIRS and TERS. SIRS is not a method where you can achieve high lateral resolution. And is TERS now ready for regular use in the study of disease, such as in the examples that you've been exploring? Or does the method still require a lot of more development or optimization? Well, I mean, this is a difficult one. I mean, we certainly want to go into this direction, but uh, one has to face the fact that the technique is around only since about 12 years. And uh, just uh, we have to compare that to microscopy, which is around since uh, two, 300 years, and still it takes took a lot of time until it was accepted in, in uh, medicine, for instance. We think that we can go into this direction. We are pushing that, um, but to, to make a use of it in the daily, uh, in, in the clinics, on a daily basis, I think lots of technical problems have to be resolved. So it has to be much more robust uh, push button uh, operation and things like that. And right now, I would say it's, it's more uh, lab technology. But uh, we are already uh, working together with clinicians and also with companies to change that. And uh, some uh, of these uh, technologies that we try to involve are looking quite promising. You just mentioned that you're working with clinicians. Um, when you collaborate with scientists in other fields, how does that affect the course of your research? Well. Um, that, that depends a lot. I mean, first of all, you have to find the proper language. So uh, it's quite interesting. We are all doing science, but uh, the, the, the target of a, of a clinician is, is totally different from that of a, a physicist or, or a chemist. Mm -hmm. And it has to be, actually. Right? I mean, they have, to, uh, they have to take care of the patient, whereas we want to have samples. And, and I, I can understand that. So sometimes uh, you have to wait until they did their surgery, and, and that's no problem. I mean, I want to be treated also very well when I'm in hospital. <laughs> but uh, it turns out that um, this is a quite fruitful collaboration. One has to find a certain basis where one finally understands one another. But after that basis has been established, I like that. I like these collaborations. And most of them last now for, for quite a long time. What are your next steps in your work on TERS? Well, uh, <laughs> to boldly go where no one has gone before, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, really, I want to, to push towards the ultimate resolution that one can achieve with this technique. I don't know where this ultimate resolution limit will be. There is uh, electromagnetic theory which tells us, so oh, this should be in the range between, let's say, 2 and 5 nanometers. But there are also the chemical contribution to that, where one has direct interaction of the chemical interaction of the metal tip and the sample molecules. So this might then even push the resolution much further. And my dream is still to do a direct sequencing of DNA or of proteins. Wow. Fantastic. Volker, thank you so much for talking to us today. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you for this very interesting discussion.